All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. It is a beautiful day here in uh, New York City. So uh, good afternoon, good evening if, you're, if it's nighttime, good morning to all my friends on the West Coast, uh, wherever you may be. Um, you know, this week uh, our webinar is gonna be um, running CockroachDB on Kubernetes. It seems to be a pretty top popular topic, but before I get into this, I just wanted to do uh, one just to give uh, some, some housekeeping here, but um, in the Zoom conference here, uh, please do ask questions. There is a QA panel. I will be monitoring um, that while Tim is doing the demo um, and then monitoring while, while we're going through some slides here. Uh, and I will pick off questions and, and either paraphrase them or ask them directly out of there. Um, so please do ask questions there. Um, at, the end of the at the end of the webinar, we will have a survey. We would love to hear your feedback. We're always uh, seeking to improve. Um, my friend Charlotte will put that into the chat window. There'll be a link at the end for that. And then, of course, before you ask, yes, a recording will be available for this uh, we, as we do make with everything um, off our website. So, um, so again, thank you for joining us. So with that, I wanted to just introduce our two panelists here, but I, I like, let's just, let's, what do you think? A little live video, Tim, Tim Vail, my We're friend here. here. We're real. We are real people. So uh, Tim and I have done uh, several different webinars together in our lives, but often we're never really in the same room, right? It's true. It's true. So it's a pleasure and an honor. We figured we would just do this one. We would actually uh, kind of kick this off here. So I am uh, I, I'm in product marketing here at Cockroach Labs. And Tim, why don't you say hello? And Yeah. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I lead our solutions engineering team here at Cockroach Labs. So excited to go through this with you today. Cool. And so, Tim, just as a conversation starter, yep. just to get ourselves kickstarted, we've been talking all morning, though. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this this webinar in particular has been pretty popular. Um, this this concept of Kubernetes, you know, the 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 the, the, the this content mm -hmm. Kubernetes as a topic it seems pretty popular. Um, you know, you are you're out there talking to Fortune yep. 500 and beyond. You know, how many customers and how many prospects are you talking to or thinking about running? You know cockroach on Kubernetes, but more importantly, just, just, you know, production use of Kubernetes out there. What are you seeing so far? Yeah, we see a lot of it. Um, I, you know, we work with lots of different enterprises, kind of large and small, and I think it's, it's very much a popular initiative out in the world. I think, you know, we see, um, you know, folks kind of all across the spectrum, people, you know, it's on their radar. Uh, some are, are just starting on the journey uh, to microservices and, you know, elected Kubernetes to kind of run or manage that for them. Uh, some are, are much more mature, but it, it's clearly a, a big trend out in the industry. And most of the enterprises that we are working with are making their way somewhere on that uh, on that journey. So we hear about it a lot, talk about it a lot. And as you know, Cockroach is a is a great fit for a back end if you are in the process of moving applications to Kubernetes. Yeah, I mean, it's been phenomenal growth over the past couple yep. of years, you know. Um, you know, if I look back two years ago, the popularity of Kubernetes to, to now, just looking at KubeCon and the size of the show, if that's any indicator, it's amazing. But yeah. I think there's not a customer on the planet or a prospect that's not talking about this, right? Absolutely. So we thought it'd be a great topic to go through. I think, you know, running Cockroach on Kubernetes is a very, very good fit. I mean, it's it's actually built to be, we, we are built to be cloud native. So um, you know, we thought we'd just kind of go through yep. this because we're hearing a lot of people actually talk through this. We get a lot of questions around this. So. Yep. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn the video off because I don't think people need to look at us all day, do they? No, I don't think Poor so. Charlotte has to though, right? All right, thank you very much. All right, so um, I'm just gonna give a little, set a little context and then uh, I'll go through some slides pretty quickly just to talk through the distributed nature of CockroachDB and give a slight overview of that before Tim gets into the demo, uh, gets into tech and shows you some more of a, let's get into the terminal window if you will, right? So, um, so let's just start with Kubernetes, right? And so just as a background, right? Kubernetes allows you to orchestrate compute within a region. Um, and what does orchestration mean? It just really allows you to kind of scale applications up and down your apps and services, if you will, um, kind of built for microservices, if you will. Um, and then ensures that these things are always on, right? Uh, you know, the, the genesis of Kubernetes really being, you know, some, some exhaust from Google and kind of the back end of Borg and, and really just the back end of they, the way that they, you know, deliver their applications and in use everywhere. I think there's some pretty big challenges within the Kubernetes community as well, um, still to date. Uh, you know, we've been struggling with federation for really quite some time. So how do you actually do, you know, geo -distribu distributed, you know, multi-region clusters? Um, these things are not simple. Um, I think there's some great teams out there working on that. Look at some projects like Crossplane is doing some cool work. The guys from Upbound doing that work around that. Um, 
Uh, Cube Fed is, you know, a, a, interesting to actually get involved in. Um, but really, I mean, clusters are kind of running as kind of their own things within each region because I think, you know, the networking bit, the security bit uh, that about, you know, cross regional clusters are, are still pretty difficult. We have a really good webinar on that, by the way. I'll, I'll put a link at the end of the, at the at, of this webinar for that one. Um, an ex, uh, one of our best engineers, a friend of ours, a uh, friend of the company for sure, Alex Robinson, gave a great presentation on, you know, truly multi-region clusters. But, you know, if we look at the kind of the state today, you know, people are just getting up and running with Kubernetes and we're seeing Kubernetes clusters pop up and they're popping up all over the place. And people are actually being able to deliver their applications at global scale, but they're kind of delivering into each one of these different data centers. The problem with actually running things like this is that, well, you have a database that's deployed and you have one in say the US West and there's one in the US East, there's one in the EU. How do you actually sync all this data across clusters? How do you deal with that kind of replication of data and that that manual movement of, of data, um, you know, throughout, and let alone let's just let's just think about you know transactional consistency. If one person is going to write a record in Europe, you have another person writing in 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 the U.S. West. Like, who wins, right? Like, and so how do you guarantee kind of transactional consistency? And so you know, as a as 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 a company, you know, Cockroach DB has been focused squarely on this exact problem. How do we actually provide this kind of global coordination? for a consistent database that, that is everywhere. Um, it's a pretty simple architecture. If you aren't familiar with us, I just need to go through some small, small basics here, but simply spin up a node anywhere. It could be a public cloud, private cloud, on Kubernetes, not, whatever that is, point it at the cluster. Um, as long as we have some sort of public IP, it's gonna speak TLS, and we're gonna have actually coordination across all the various different nodes. So while you're running Kubernetes in each one of these data centers, the data itself and the database itself is actually taking care of kind of coordination and consensus of queries and transactions across these kind of broadly distributed uh, geographies, right? So each node within a, in a cockroach database, if you think each one of those, those canisters there, can actually take a request and access the rest of the data. The data is actually stored all over the place. It's distributed everywhere, right? And so each node is a single consistent gateway to the rest of the entire database. It's just truly phenomenal. And the, the, through global coordination, we can actually uh, implement serialized, serializable, man, that's a tough one. It's a tough one. It's serializable isolation at scale, right? And so um, another, some of the other benefits of this, you know, we can actually uh, autom automate the, the replication of data across the planet, repair, rebalancing. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more. Um, but one of the unique things that Cockroach can do, uh, unlike any other database that I'm familiar with, is, is being able to attach location to a data. If you imagine a row of data, we can actually domicile that in some geography, if you will. Basically, all we're doing is we're just tagging a, a node and saying, I want data to live on that node. And we use you know, some of our primary key technology to understand exactly where that data needs to live. So we can actually have data either live in a place because of some sort of you know, um, you know, compliance with, with privacy, uh, but more importantly, maybe it's to follow a user as they move across the planet. Ultimately, I believe if you're going to do anything in sort of a distributed SQL manner, a distributed database, you've got to have some sort of locality because, you know, the, the, the latency between various different regions is, you know, it can get really, really high. So, um, so with that, let me just give a, well, one last thing, uh, by the way, just before I get a little bit deeper into kind of how it works inside, um, this is inherently multi-cloud as well, right? So we can actually deploy a node anywhere you want, again, as long as it can connect to the rest of the cluster we can have a single database that's now not just spanning multiple data centers, but spanning multiple clouds as well, uh, be it on-prem, in the public cloud, whatever you want, right? And so um, another kind of unique characteristic of, of, of CockroachDB. So, um, so how does Cockroach do this, right? So if you look at data in Cockroach, uh, you know, it's just, it's tables, right? And so uh, this is a distributed SQL database. This is SQL. This isn't, you know, some weird kind of variant of SQL um, we aren't requiring you to learn some new language. This is SQL. And so we are wire compatible with Postgres. Um, and we're really built for kind of these large kind of read, write, distributed transactional workloads. But ultimately underneath the covers, the table's a table. So you just think of this is a dog's table. Um, and what we implement is really is kind of monolithic, kind of logical ordered key space. So if you look at these dogs, Carl, Downey, Figment, Jack, right? It's, it's all in order, right? So we have this ordered list of, of of data within this table. What we do is we break down a table into these kind of contiguous 64 megabit chunks. And these 64 megabit chunks are then distributed across the cluster. 
Um, and I'll show you how we do that. But we do this so that we can actually, we can write, you know, uh, we write in a triplicate. So we create replicas. So if nodes go down, we still have data, right? But it's a key piece of what we're able to do. They're small enough that we can actually move them around pretty easily. If they grow too big, we can actually split them and create new ranges. Um, but this is a key kind of concept behind what we're doing. And it's why we're able to be distributed and live very well on top of Kubernetes. Now, if you're going to create ranges, well, you need to have an index so you can actually locate those. So we actually implement an index and we can understand these things. It, it's, this is very much a kind of similar structure to like a B tree. Um, and, and by being a kind of this monolithic kind of, you know, logically ordered set, we can do things like some very quick range scans. So if you want to like, you know, data between muddy and sushi, it's, Kind of easy to get that you're gonna have this kind of really quick access um but we're gonna understand it you know across range what what these things kind of look like right now um within cockroach db we also we implement raft uh raft is actually takes care of replication and is actually the way in which kind of all things are you know we, we build consensus within within uh, the cluster itself right and so each range, uh, if you think about that, you know, on the previous slide, we had, you know, three ranges. Each one of those is a raft group, if you're familiar with raft. Um, and raft is really giving kind of, it's a, it, it is really what's driving consensus um, within a distributed system. If you're not familiar with raft, there's lots of kind of tutorials out there. Um, I would definitely go out and check it out. I don't want to get too deep into raft here today, but I just wanted to kind of talk through a little bit because we just need to explain a concept of how we actually gain consensus how we actually distribute data within a distributed SQL database. So for us, we're actually, uh, we default to three replicas. Uh, this is actually configurable. So a RAP group can be actually bigger, um, but that's what we do. Now, ultimately there is a leaseholder. In RAF, you'll hear this is kind of the, the RAF leader. We kind of equate it with le leaseholder, some little nuances of the way we do this, but this is really kind of what's allowing us to basically control each RAF group. And, and the RAF leader is really kind of uh, in control of basically rights, maintaining transactions in that thing, making sure that all the replicas are alive. Um, and then the RAF protocol, if a leader dies, well, the rest of the RAF group actually knows that and can actually elect a new leader. There's a lot of, there's a lot of complexity within RAF that, that's interesting. And honestly, it's a very compelling uh, read. So if you are familiar with it, I go check it out. It's kind of cool. So, but it's a foundation of kind of how we implement distributed SQL and how this actually all works in a distributed database and what allows us to get to kind of this global scale because these replicas, right? This, this table space we have, you know, Carl three, you know, these three replicas that we have, well, we're able to actually uh, deploy them across a distributed set of nodes. So each one of those four nodes uh, that's listed on this page here, each one of those is an instance of cockroach DB in this, in this situation, they look like they're all very close to each other that we could have, you know, we'd have three in one region, we could have three in US East, we could have three in the EU. And, and Cockroach is gonna be smart enough to actually distribute these ranges, the triplicates, across multiple different places so that we can actually you know, optimize against failure uh, domains, right? So if a disk goes down or a rack or a data center region. And so there's a lot of logic that's gone into this diversity, right? And the way in which we actually deploy or write these replicas across a, a distributed system. And then you know, we write the blue one, we write the red one, and ultimately all the data gets distributed across multiple different nodes, right? And so. Um, it's important to do so, so that if a node goes away, we're still going to have two copies of that data, right? We, we protect ourselves from failure domains. We can also do some interesting things about, you know, about placing replicas around load. Um, you know, if a range is hot, uh, you know, it gets lots of access. Uh, we can actually understand that internally. We can understand, let's isolate that maybe in its own node or in a node that's, you know, has less traffic or whatever it is so that we can actually optimize uh, that, that, that usage as well. So, we're using heuristics underneath the, underneath the cover to actually take care of that. And then the third way in which we do this, a couple of other things that we do, that I'm just kind of blowing through the, the top level stuff here. Um, you know, the third way is this, this whole concept of latency and geo partitioning. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, CockroachDB is a key value store where the key represents basically primary key. Um, but we can, we actually, write a lot into the primary key. In fact, we had a blog post recently about that that I, I'm happy to share with you guys in the chat as well. I'll, I'll find that while Tim is doing the demo, but you know, the way that you construct primary keys within, uh, or I'm sorry, the keys and the key value pair within Cockroach is really, really important. One of the interesting things that we can do is we can embed location into that so that we can actually understand you know, each of our ranges where they need to be placed. So here, I'm extracting, I'm extracting out a whole lot of detail here. I think engineers might 
shoot me if they see the, the amount of abstraction here. But, um, you know, we can now actually understand, you know, where ranges need to live and we can actually bring that down to the row level because each row has its own key, right? And so now we can actually partition and place data where it needs to be. And that's actually the magic behind um, really how we do geo partitioning within within cockroach DB. So, you know, three quick ways of doing this. There's diversity, there's load, and then there's this kind of locality and, and latency, right? Latency in a distributed SQL database is extremely important. Um, you want data to live near users. You want leaseholders who are actually um, taking in requests and transactions. You want that to live where people are actually making those transactions. Um, because ultimately when you do some sort of like globally you know, geo distributed database, you know, latencies across, you know, multiple different places um, are typically, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges, right? And so, um, so let me just come back to this one second. Um, one last thing before I get into the, uh, again, the bits and bytes here, and I want to get into a terminal window, but three, three slides, three slides. Um, if you add a node, so you go into Kubernetes and you scale up CockroachDB and you, you know, bump up the number of nodes that you need, it's gonna create a node somewhere, right? And so Cockroach is smart enough to actually redistribute the data. So we're gonna move the data, um, you know, from one node to the next and then clean up the, the, old, the old set of data so that we have more even distribution of our data across these five nodes now. But what happens in the case of a permanent failure? What happens if a node goes down because you all are familiar with Kubernetes. There's a reason why we're here, right? Um, things fail, right? And so if a node goes down, the raft group realizes that a replica is missing and then replaces it with a new uh, replica on an active node. So the raft leader in this case for the blue range was in node three, it looks like, and the leaseholder are node two. And the raft leader for the red pink one was on node four. It knew that it was missing one of its replicas and it instantly created um, a replica on a live active node. So this is the way that we can actually survive and really deliver this kind of resiliency across you know, multiple different nodes in distributed SQL database. So ultimately, if you think about like kind of the way that we run a distributed SQL database, and, and like I said, there's a lot more detail there. I wanted to give like a quick like 10 minute um, because I think it aligns very well with some of the concepts that are in Kubernetes, right? If we, if we think about Cockroach, it's just another application that lives on top of Kubernetes. I mean, it's a containerized application. You just deploy, right? And you're using a Helm chart. Tim's going to get into that. Um, and the way we deploy, you know, is actually pretty important, um, you know, using stateful sets and, and, and talking through storage. Tim's going to talk to this. But, you know, I think one of the things that we get asked a lot about is kind of operators. And I think a lot of the reason that some databases will use operators is because they aren't distributed, right? And so if we think about, you know, scaling up the database, so adding a node and replicas were just, you know, moved around. Well, how do you do that in a traditional database? Often people use operators to do those sort of things. We don't need that sort of thing. What happens, you know, when you want to upgrade this database? We could just fail a node and bring it back up. Like rolling upgrades become real easy for us because ultimately CockroachDB was architected in a very similar way as Kubernetes. If you think about, you know, the, the genesis of Cockroach, um, and the genesis of Kubernetes, well, you know, if Spanner originated in Borg, right, and that's Google Cloud Spanner, if you're familiar with that, um, the same white paper, a lot of the same concepts are in CockroachDB, Borg being the predecessor to Kubernetes. Um, here we are implementing CockroachDB, but it's available on all clouds um, and any instance of Kubernetes wherever you live, Kubernetes being a descendant of, of Borg, um, you know, there's just really, really good alignment here. And so, you know, it's funny, we, like I said, again, we get asked about operators all the time. And the funny thing is, is like, well, yep, yeah, but we're already a distributed application. I think there's some things that we can do with operators. I think they're extremely powerful. Um, you know, I think this original concept of Brandon Phillips and the team kind of came up with this. It's, it's truly powerful to help us run applications. And I think there's some things that we can do. Um, but at the, like the core principles of what they're there for, like rolling upgrades, that sort of yeah. stuff, you know, we're, we're pretty good at that already. So that's all I have, my, mar my marketing, -y, my marketing, marketing. -y slides. Let's do it. All right, thanks, Tim. So um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Tim. All right. And I promise the terminal. Yeah, there's nothing more exciting than uh, showing the terminal during a presentation. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's talk about a few things. Before we jump into the terminal, I just wanted to cover um, a couple definitions. You know, Jim mentioned them. Uh, but I, I do think they're important. And, and you know, out of, you know, a full review of Kubernetes, what it is, why it is, is probably out of scope for this discussion. But I did want to talk about a couple things that you'll hear us mention and that we leverage 
in order to deploy uh, Kubernetes or Cockroach DB to Kubernetes. So a couple things real quick. Uh, and there's lots of great documentation, obviously, on the web, not only on our site, but certainly on uh, the Kubernetes site to get into this a little bit um, in greater detail. But a couple things here, stateful set. So there are a number of ways, uh, if you're deploying an application today in Kubernetes, there are a number of ways to deploy applications to Kubernetes. We have elected to uh, leverage something that was fairly recently released called a stateful set. And uh, among uh, you know, a variety of the features that a stateful set provides, it really uh, provides for or allows for kind of sticky network and storage so that as pods are being uh, destroyed or added to a stateful set, they retain the identity that they were originally given. And this makes it uh, very simple to do uh, or to deploy a database like CockroachDB. So you'll hear us mention stateful set. It's not the only way in theory that you could deploy Cockroach to Kubernetes, but it is kind of the way that we feel like uh, the industry is going and, and what we have elected to do. Uh, the other thing that you'll hear us talk a lot about is persistent volumes or persistent volume claims. And again, the idea here is that a persistent volume um, decouples essentially the lifetime of the storage or volume uh, from the Kubernetes pod. And so this is, is something that's critical, uh, not only to stateful sets in general, but to CockroachDB. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna go through today or talk about is Helm and Helm charts. So if you haven't heard uh, of this uh, or these technologies, I highly recommend you taking a look. Uh, but Helm, uh, much like apt or um, yum for an OS, is kind of a package manager for Kubernetes. So it's a, lot, it's a great way to kind of define an application deployment and then do things like um, define a deployment through a chart, but then do things like uh, leverage Helm to do installs, upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. A um, couple other things before I, I, I demonstrate uh, CockroachDB running on Kubernetes that, uh, that I wanted to just touch on again. So for us and with us, you can run anywhere, right? I mean, when you talk about Kubernetes, there are a tremendous amount of options now emerging um, in the marketplace. You can certainly deploy on-prem. In fact, what you're gonna see today is running a Kubernetes cluster just on my laptop. Um, you, can, you can build out Kubernetes infrastructure in a private cloud that you manage, and certainly there are a whole host of hosted solutions. And beyond that, you know, there are a number of flavors of Kubernetes that are emerging. So, you know, we're going to go through just kind of a basic default local install of Kubernetes. But when we think about and talk about running Cockroach DB in Kubernetes, we can really run anywhere. And so uh, keep that in mind as we go through that. And the other thing is that, you know, we can really run any way that you want to. Um, if you want to run just a simple single cluster running in a local environment, that's fine. If you want to deploy Kubernetes across multiple regions, a multi-cluster approach, we support that as well. Um, and again, in terms of how we go about deploying or building out a cluster, there in our documentation at least a handful of ways we describe that. You can certainly define your cluster using stateful set config files. That's kind of the, the Kubernetes native way to do that. But what we're gonna show and walk through today is actually defining and building a cluster using a Helm chart. That simplifies the process, I think, considerably. So before I get into the terminal specifically, I did wanna draw your attention to um, a GitHub repo that I created for this. It uh, walks through just a number of the kind of the prerequisites that you might use to get started in order to build out this example. Um, I also might um, send you over to our documentation, um, which if I can pull up here, and I'll have Charlotte or Jim post this all into, um, into, into the chat window. But we've got fantastic documentation, not only about uh, deploying Kubernetes or deploying Cockroach to Kubernetes, but really all sorts of orchestration frameworks. So please do take some time there, or if you like, uh, you can follow along with this particular um, GitHub repo that I've created. So without further ado, let's jump into uh, the process of actually spinning up and starting a cluster. And I'm going to follow along kind of in my documentation here about how to do that. So the very first thing that we're going to do, and, and, and I've already done this on my machine, but I've created, um, installed and created Minikube. Um, it, it's up and running. And the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that Helm is, has been initiated. And Helm, again, is part of what is um, going to be installing the cluster for us. So give me just a second here. Let's make sure Helm is initialized. And it looks like it already is. That's great. 
And so what we're going to do here, if I just run back through these commands, is go through the process of installing Cockroach. This is a very simple command using Helm. What this is referring to again is our Helm chart, which defines how to deploy and manage a cluster in Kubernetes. It's as simple as this single command once your, um, once your prerequisites are installed. And so I've, uh, I've run this command and you can see from the output, we have essentially a three node cluster, which is beginning to be um, deployed. The status is pending. If I jump over here real quickly and do port forwarding, um, oh, pod's not running yet. It will be in just a second. Give it a few times. It takes a little minute here. There we go. So the port, port is being forwarded and now I can jump over to our cluster overview. And I don't know, on your screen, is this cut in half like it is on mine? Yeah, it's cut in half, Tim. That is weird. I wonder why that is. Let me stop sharing and see if that changes things. Just a second. There you go. I think your, your browser is half. It doesn't. Oh, there we go. That looks better, doesn't it? All right, let's go back to sharing. Okay, and so with that, I have started a three node Cockroach DB cluster in Kubernetes. And you can see I have three nodes here. I have uh, 20 replicas on each node. And this is something I'm going to draw your attention to in just a second. So before I um, start running a workload, which I want to do, and we'll walk through the Cockroach DB interface, I wanted to do something else real quick. We talked about the, uh, the ease at which you can add or remove nodes. And so I'm going to very quickly scale up this cluster to five replicas. And again, using Helm, using our definition of a Helm chart, it's as simple as, um, as running a command like this. So I'm gonna quickly add an additional two nodes. And if I hop over to uh, the CockroachDB interface and refresh, what do you see? You see uh, I've added an additional two nodes to the cluster, but one of the things that's interesting here, and this is what Jim was talking to about ranges, replicas, how easy it is, for us to scale and deploy, you'll see that the replica count, while it had been equally distributed among three with 20 replicas each, you're now starting to see that these new nodes that have come into the cluster are beginning to take over some of that load. And so you'll see here total ranges is, uh, is 20. We have a couple under replicated ranges and we can talk a little bit about that. But you'll see that over time, the cluster begins to balance out. And this is an important kind of concept. Uh, the first three nodes have been up for two minutes, but we have a, a few additional nodes that have been recently added. So this is all well and good, but it's really not too terribly exciting unless we actually initiate a workload on the cluster. And so what I'm going to do right now is execute something that's built into Cockroach. It's a little bit of a workload generator. It creates some tables, it runs some tests. And so that's what we're going to do right now, run some SQL statements. We're going to generate some load on this cluster, and we're going to point you to a couple things. And then just like you would expect with Kubernetes and with CockroachDB, we're going to start to kill things off and watch how the cluster behaves. So if you hold on just a second here, uh, we are going to initiate a workload, which again, just using kubectl, which you, um, which you know well. Oops, let me control C in just a second to find that command. And we're going to initialize this workload, which is essentially going to create uh, a series of tables and load that data. And so we've initiated a workload. And now what we're going to do is actually run the workload. And so give me just a second here to run that command. And what you should begin to see now is a bunch of activity, a bunch of queries being executed on the cluster. And so if I were to come over here, and I'll just kind of do a quick walkthrough of the interface. Um, this is our, our dashboard. It's accessible via any node in the cluster, by the way. Um, we, as Jim mentioned, are, are completely symmetrical. A binary is a binary, a binary. A node is a node is a node. So every node can not only serve requests, but actually um, show this, the, these metrics. And so if I were to hop over to the metrics tab, what you begin to see now is that, yeah, there's some activity now happening on the cluster. I'm executing queries. Uh, I've created a database. I created something called uh, the bank database, um, which has a table uh, called bank. And this is where the activity in the cluster is currently happening. 
And so we'll see here, um, I'll give this just a minute or so to run, but we've got a whole bunch of activity being executed uh, on the cluster. In fact, we're, we're running a whole bunch of update statements and we'll come into this uh, screen in just a minute. But again, to kind of demonstrate not only the beauty of Kubernetes, but to demonstrate the beauty of Cockroach, what I want to do now is start to disrupt the cluster a little bit. And again, if you think about kind of traditional databases that are deployed using some sort of active passive or eventual consistency model, when, when things start to go wrong, it gets very complicated, not only initially, but in an effort to recover from a failed state. With Cockroach, things are very different. Um, and certainly Cockroach running in Kubernetes, I can simply start to destroy nodes and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna fall off or revert into some kind of weird recovery state. We're just gonna keep on trucking. And that's what you should see here. So I'm going to jump into another terminal here and I'm going to kill a node if I can. So let me hop over to my trusty GitHub. And we are going to delete a pod, in effect, kill a pod. So kubectl delete, right? So you're you using basically, it, so again, we're basically in Kubernetes and we're just killing off pods, right? Just killing off a pod. I'm gonna kill off a pod and what would I expect to see happening here? So if I jump over to the overview, you'll see that for just a moment here, I've got a suspect node. One of my nodes has, has disappeared. Um, I had jumped up to five, but I have a node that's suspect. And what also has happened is I have some under-replicated ranges, but Kubernetes, right, is automatically, and Cockroach is automatically healing the cluster. And so what's happened? So at the same time, both are taking care of what they're supposed to take care of. Absolutely. And if I were to, and you know, I, just, I don't know how well this shows in, in a demo, but what you can see here is all the data, all my activity on the cluster is continuing. I'm continuing to transfer bank accounts here or initiate transfers in my bank database. Um, but I lost a node during that process. And so what happened? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Kubernetes is ensuring the application is still live and available. It's like self-driving, right? It's still there. Yeah, Always absolutely. going to be available. And then the database itself is actually, because we have replicas written across multiple different nodes. It's beautiful. Every node via a single consistent gateway into the database, we still have access to that data. Absolutely. And so you can see, you know, six minutes ago, I started the rest of the cluster. But just a minute ago, I deleted deleted a node and the work So Kubernetes continue. is being Kubernetes. Kubernetes is being and Kubernetes. Cockroach is being and Cockroach. Cockroach is being Cockroach. So a couple other things and then um, I wanted to run through kind of the statements page because I think it's interesting and then and then we can wrap up. So I have a five node cluster. You can see that, that we've maintained balance and replicas. I'm going to jump back in here and go back to my command and I'm going to add a couple nodes because um, why have a five node cluster when you can have a seven node cluster? So we'll add because another. seven's better than five. That is correct. And so we'll jump up to seven. And what should I see here? I should hopefully, if everything goes as planned, I should see. Man. There you go with your half screen know, browser. Half screen. I keep doing half screens. That really, really frustrates me. You must have like a window snap. I do. Yeah. And so boom, there you go. Just within a simple command using kubectl, using Kubernetes, I have scaled my cluster right. to seven nodes. And oh, by the way, what are we going to begin to see happening? Um, the replicas are going to begin to rebalance. And, and so, what was the kubectl right. command again? Yeah, let's go back to that. So, very simple to do. Q so, kubectl scale stateful set. Yeah. Yep. Name the name of the stateful set or, or the cluster and the number of replicas that you want. And you right. can do this all day long. And oh, by the way. What's happening over here in the workload that we're generating? It's continuing to progress, right? There's no stop. There's no pause in activity, nothing. We're going to continue to serve requests. The cluster's going to continue to accept and serve transactions. Um, highly resilient. Like, highly resilient. Just bring like down RPO, that. bring down RTO, all, all that great stuff. So I want to just real quick, because I think this is kind of an interesting feature of, of Cockroach to be not necessarily related to Kubernetes, but I think it's kind of an interesting thing. We, we spent a lot of time building out this interface. And one of the, the most important things um, that the database developers, DBAs, are, are, are oftentimes looking at is kind of performance, right? How are my queries performing? And so one of the things that we do is show um, a unique fingerprint for any statement that's run in the cluster. One of the things that's running right now, as you can see, we've been executing roughly 42,000 update bank statements 
Uh, but what Cockroach does, which I think is really, really cool, is uh, provides you great amount of metrics from the, the interface about um, these statements. So I can see how many times this particular statement has been run using this workload, what's its average mean latency, how many rows are being impacted. Um, I, we break down um, the query execution into the various phases that CockroachDB goes through, parse, plan, run. Uh, so you, you get a sense of how long um, we're spending in each operation. We can see where the cluster has run, how many times it's been retried. Uh, but what's also really interesting is we prehydrate and display for you an execution plan or logical plan. And so in this particular case, uh, you might be able to diagnose potentially performance issues if, for example, you saw that um, there was a scan instead of a seek or we weren't properly using indexes. So a lot of really powerful stuff within um, the Cockroach UI, probably not in scope for, um, for this exercise, but I thought it was interesting to show and verify that, hey, we have this workload running. It continues to run. Meanwhile, I'm disrupting the health of the cluster by adding and removing nodes. We had, again, we had a quick comment in the chat window. Somebody said very nice. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So um, one of the things that came through, Tim, we were talking about kind yeah. of, um, I don't know how familiar you are with replica sets as well, but there's kind of replica sets and stateful sets. What is a stateful set doing for us in this context? Yeah, so what it's really providing here is this ability to kind of have stickiness around storage, network identity, et cetera, et cetera. So as, as we just demonstrated when we dropped a node, right, we want to have essentially the volume that, uh, that backed that node to remain kind of sticky to a, a network identity or a host identity that we've provided, our node identity. And so replica sets um, don't really provide that for right. you, right? Replica sets are really designed more for kind of stateless workloads. In this particular case, there is, you know, this is a database, right? It's a little bit more complicated than your traditional microservice. And so there's actually a whole bunch of good documentation kind of on the differences between replica sets and stateful sets. There are, um, it, there is an ability to run Cockroach using um, Damien sets, which is yet Damien another kind of um, flavor in Kubernetes, yeah. but kind of our best practice is staple sets. So you get kind of that, that consistent look from a storage and networking perspective yeah. as things go up and down, which we would expect that they do. Yep. Um, another question we get a lot, and, yeah. and you know, I know it's a, it's a little bit more of a difficult question, but I'm not you know, here if you're going to, oh, come on. Softball, if you're going to run um, Cockroach D across multiple different regions. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I'll come back to the localization of data. Somebody had a question yeah. around that as well. But when we start running Cockroach in multiple different Kubernetes clusters, because I think Kubernetes still struggles a little bit with federation, yeah. um, you know, you know, multi-region Kubernetes, like I said, like, I think there's a couple of things out there that are trying to solve that. Um, how does it affect from a networking point of view for a Cockroach DB instance, right? Because you know, networking is kind of one of the biggest challenges of, you know, multi-clusters, right? And so how does that work with, with CockroachDB? Well, you know, the, the, the reality is it, 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 that's almost not a Kubernetes type question. I mean, in some respects, right, these are problems that need to be solved regardless of whether you're working in Kubernetes or not, right? Um, you know, nodes need to be able to talk to other nodes. That's kind of one of the fundamental things about a Cockroach deployment. And that would hold true, again, whether you are running, you know, directly on bare metal or whether you're running in Kubernetes. So, you know, networking is always going to be a little bit of a challenge. And, and you're right. I mean, Kubernetes itself, that's an area that's been, you know, undergoing, I think, yeah. some, some change and certainly some investment. And so um, we have, uh, and I might direct you or Charlotte maybe can, can direct us. We have a great uh, uh, page in our site that really talks about kind of performance optimizations in Kubernetes. And what it really is doing is talking about best practices for storage, node type, also networking, right? Because at the end of the day, what you need to have is you ha need to have and expose the ability for nodes to talk to each other yep. cross region, right? And so there are a number of different ways that you can do that depending upon whether you are deployed in, you know, a hosted provider like GKE, which we have a lot of great documentation on or whether you're using Amazon, the, the, the ways you do it are a little bit different. Right. Uh, it really kind of depends on your philosophy, um, what you want to do. But, but at the end of the day, the solution is, right, or the, the, the requirement is nodes need to be able to talk to each other. Right. Uh, the benefit there is when you do deploy in a multi-tenant or multi-cluster environment is you get to survive now the loss of potentially an entire region. And oh, by the way, right, if we extrapolate this out to providers, right. and we're seeing this quite a bit where not only am I surviving the loss of an entire region failure, 
what if I survive the loss of Google being unavailable or Amazon being unavailable for a, for a period of time? And so all that is possible. Yeah, and it's just a matter of intelligent in understanding where your replicas are yeah, and distributed absolutely. data and all these things. I mean, everything is configurable, and absolutely. I think that's the key thing. And so it's like public IP address from a node, uh, VPC out, whatever you want to yeah. do, you're going to have your connectivity. It's just basically ensuring connectivity. Yeah. DNS um, chaining, you know, VPC peering, there's right. lots of different ways that, that we can accomplish that. And, right. and, and we have folks doing it today. Yep. Yep. That's cool. And so I think it's a, I think it's one of the biggest challenges people have with just Kubernetes in particular, I think is the whole, the, the networking side seems to be one of those things that uh, still is, is, is a bit challenging to people. So it is, and there, you know, Kubernetes, uh, you know, if you're new to it, it, it takes a little bit of, of time to kind of wrap your head around it's a paradigm shift. It is. It, wrap your head around the vernacular, the vocabulary, yeah. the terminology, all of that stuff. Um, and yeah. certainly networking is, is, a, is a complication, but um, certainly can be done. The other thing that comes up a lot we might mention is security. So, you know, what I deployed or displayed here was an insecure cluster. Um, certainly we can run in a secure mode um, using TLS 1.2. I think, Jim, you mentioned that at the beginning. Um, there are a whole host of options for running in secure mode. The, the example that I gave was a, a relatively simple insecure cluster, but yep. we certainly have lots of controls around security as well. Yeah. So yeah, and that, uh, security, networking, tough. The third piece of mm -hmm. that of that that stool mm -hmm. uh, ch of challenge, I guess, the challenge stool. The challenge stool. Network right. security storage. Uh -oh. Right. Did we talk about storage? You know, we might and have glossed so, over that. How a that bit. Yeah, I kind of glossed over it, and so. Can you just talk through how CockroachDB works with storage? And, and you know, I mean, not, like, like, yeah, stateful sets is gonna help with like local storage and local sure. memory. Not that, right? Like we're talking about something else here, right? Yeah, so storage, you know, again, with Kubernetes and, and with Cockroach, there's a lot of knobs and dials that you can turn. So stateful sets uh, allow you to be, um, you know, to define essentially a storage class. And what is a storage class? It's, it's um, it, it defines how and where storage is provisioned. And so, uh, if you are running in GKE or running in one of the other cloud providers, they may have a default uh, storage class or provisioner, which describes how and where storage is defined and uh, provisioned in the cluster. And there are, uh, I mean, numerous, numerous options for that. Uh, one of the, you know, whether it's cloud-based storage, whether it's local storage, um, it, you know, again, there are, there are, there are partners and, and vendors in this space that are offering storage solution. For us, what it really do, it comes down to is choices that you want to make around performance, security, resiliency. Uh, maybe it's, it, it's a partner that you've trusted and worked with before or that you're using on the app side. Uh, chances are they're going to provide a storage class. That's something that can be integrated into the stateful set and, um, and we can work. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I think the, the key here is there are many options. Uh, we support uh, a great deal of them, and, it, and it's really easy to do, particularly with Helm. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, when I first found Kubernetes, my biggest challenge was like, okay, I mean, I don't understand how to run a database on this thing, and right. actually understanding the storage class and understanding persistent volume and persistent volume claim and how that yep. works. Um, and the, I think the Kubernetes documentation is really fantastic on that, but ultimately we're just mounting a volume. Th I mean, that's each right. Node has its own volume. And, and I don't gonna... know, you know, and, and, if, and again, I've referenced, and, and we'll send, send links uh, to kind of the, our best practices around Kubernetes yep. as a whole, we kind of go through a whole thing around storage about what we're seeing, um, what's available out there. And I think it's, um, you know, it, it's definitely worth a read if you're starting on this journey to kind of make sure you understand uh, storage yep. classes and what works yeah, yeah. best for your, your work. So absolutely, I want to, there, there's a lot of really good questions here, Tim. So uh -oh. I'm kind of trying to, I'm trying to paraphrase, either you did a horrible job or we're doing there's a list a lot of interest. I think there's a lot of people really interested in this. It's stuff. probably so, ended a horrible job. Yeah, exactly. So, um, from I, I, actually, one thing before we go yeah. on from storage, actually, I just want to shout out to the Rook team. And uh, if, you, if you guys are all familiar with, with Rook, which is one of the, I think, an incubating po project within the CNCF, um, yep. the Rook team actually built an operator that actually works with Cockroach DB yep. that is allowing you to, it's allowing you to deploy distributed storage like Ceph, right? And so there is an operator out there to actually use Rook. And a Rook operator to do to do distributed storage. So now you have like a, a distributed database and then distributed volumes underneath that. It's kind of like yeah. you know double bang for your buck. So we actually get multiple different levels of re resiliency. But let me come back and kind of drill in a little bit on the resiliency thing here. And so you know there's been a there's been a couple questions here actually three or four actually. Um, you know, let me paraphrase all of them together. 
Why was what, this demo so bad? No, no, <laughs> no. That actually there was a lot of those too. No, but it's more around kind of the the reliability and resiliency, and yeah. kind of what is the best practice for kind of how you architect cockroach on top of this, right? Like, so, you know, you have three, is it three nodes? Is it four nodes? Is it five? What when you're in multiple different regions, you know, that kind of stuff. Can you just talk about like the, the topologies, right? Cause I think yeah. different applications have different requirements yeah, and different topology concerns, right? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, for, for, you know, optimizing, I think one question was on, you know, the reliability of the cluster itself. Like what, what are you, what are you typically telling people? Well, so it's actually, we, we spend a lot of time talking about this. And in fact, one of the, the questions we often ask when we're sitting with folks is, what is it that you want to survive? Um, I, I think that's kind of an interesting way to start a, a conversation about cockroach. Um, and, and so what I mean by that is, you know, clustering uh, traditional databases has, has been hard, right? Uh, clustering is hard, but really scaling databases has been hard. Typically, that's something that you have to do vertically. Now that you can scale horizontally your database, um, a whole lot of options um, uh, kind of are available to you that weren't before. And so when we say, what do you want to survive? What we mean by that is, uh, do you want to design a cluster that can survive the loss of a single node? Do you want to survive uh, or design a cluster that can survive the loss of an availability zone if you're out in the cloud? Uh, maybe a region, uh, maybe something as extreme as I want to survive the, the outage of a cloud provider, right? And so each one of those kind of um, scenarios have a slightly yeah. different design, right? And so uh, what we often talk about is, all right, what do you want to survive fundamentally? And then we start from there. Now, do you want to survive? Or what we often recommend, I should say, is um, when we design, sit down and think about what you want to survive from an unplanned outage, right? But also be able to survive an unplanned outage during some planned maintenance window. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, we often talk about is our ability to scale globally, right? And that's a fantastic and unique value proposition. But the reality is some people just want to run a three or five node cluster, you know, in a single availability zone, and that's fine too. So, yeah. you, you know, we can be a very simple deployment and just provide almost in effect some really simple Postgres clustering all the way up to a globally scaled database infrastructure that can survive all sorts of dramatic failure scenarios. Yeah, and so it basically can evolve the way that you yeah. want to do. So three nodes, four nodes, five, five nodes, nodes, seven nodes, let's multiple the, regions. I mean, exactly, it, it let's can, take the simplest, right? So I, I love this concept of like, yeah, just, you know, it's a, it's Postgres database, it's super resilient, yep. right? Because if things go down and you don't have to, I mean, I think ultimately one of the biggest things is like, you don't have to do sharding anymore, right? Yeah, like right. It's, it just we automates all, all of that, that, right? We take care of all that for you. and. And what's interesting as we start to deploy Cockroach across multiple, say, for example, availability zones, and we leverage our ability to define locality, uh, what in effect Cockroach is doing is it's ensuring that a copy of a particular range is distributed across those unique locations. So that again, you can survive, um, you know, the destruction of an availability zone or right. the interruption of availability zone. The other thing that we often talk about, and it's an important consideration is performance, right? You know, at the end of the day, um, the speed of light is a constraint. Um, and no, I, come on. Well, it, it turns out it is. I, <laughs> I didn't think so, but it is. Uh, and so what oftentimes we will begin to do is once we've kind of defined what you want to survive, now how performant do you want to be? And so what that can sometimes mean is adding additional clusters within regions so that rights don't have to travel a very far distance in order to achieve quorum. And so, right. you know, for you kind of like, what's a uh, best practice? And we do a lot of um, you know, three cluster, you know, three cluster deployments, you know, three node deployments. Yeah. No, I'd like three cluster deployments. Yeah. So, you know, a, a three or five node cluster in US East, a three and a five, a three to five node cluster in US Central, three to five nodes in, in the West. I mean, that's kind of a very I think easy we're seeing way to get a lot started, of that, right? right? I mean, that's very kind of the, the same started. pattern we're seeing over and over again, right? And so, um, one, lack, one last question before we wrap this all up. Um, and, and there was a couple of questions that were in the chat that, I think we'll take like some significant answer time. So <laughs> I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question um, to some of the people in the chat window. Like I said, it's a, I gotta watch time too. Um, one last thing though, and it just comes back and it's kind of related to this topic. Um, somebody was asking about um, regional data and yeah. how we can tie it to a location. And yeah. so I, how do you go about thinking about that in your application, right? Cause I mean, it's a different, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a paradigm shift, right? Like. 
Because I think at the application layer, we were basically kind of trying to control where data lives and that sort of thing, right? And so how, how do you kind of think about that with when, you, when you're talking to customers? You know, I, I want German data to live in Germany and German servers, right? Like uh, for some privacy thing, or, you know, maybe it is follow, the, follow the, the user, right? Yeah, so I think, you know, generally speaking, what we have seen uh, that we see with a lot of our customers is that location is something that's part of their data anyway. Right. Yep. You know, this is not some contrived attribute that we have to force upon a data model. Most of, you know, most of the, the organizations we're working with, you know, they have a concept of a user. They have a concept of a store. They have a concept of something that has kind of location built in. And so what you have the ability to do within Cockroach is uh, essentially define a partition that says, you know, I want German data. You know, I'm going to create right. a, a partition for Germany, my German region or my Paris region or my U.S. region. And then what you have the ability to do is down to the row level, actually. Hey, my user, their, their country of origin is Germany. I'm going to say anytime I see this value in this column, on this row, that data must be constrained to live in nodes that have a locality that I've defined as German. Yep. Uh, and so it's this combination of partitioning, you know, an alter statement is I create a partition. And then I, what I can do is constrain that partition yep. to a locality that I define. And yep. so it becomes incredibly easy to say, now all of my data, any row in this table, any row in this database, whose country equals X must live in my data centers or my nodes that were started with that locality. And so we've got a whole bunch of great examples yeah. and documentation yeah. on that, but it becomes very, very simple to do with and it, and it comes back to the topology and the overall architecture yeah. that you're trying to do. And, and honestly, like you, I think, you know, cockroach can be used in lots of different ways and it just depends on, you know, how you want to optimize for it. Um, you know, what's the role of a load balancer? Well, it's just your application that's hitting, you know, different nodes within the database, right? You, each basic node in the cluster still has access to all the data. Mm -hmm. Every one of them is a single consistent gateway to the rest of the database, which is actually is a really paramount kind of important thing to understand about Cockroach. It's not going through one place. I don't need to find a leaseholder to ask a question. The, 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 the database does that, right? So Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things I keep coming back to, though, is, is this idea that, you know, we can deploy very sophisticated architectures that span the globe, but it's really also interesting to have just a simple... Yeah, single cluster running in a location. Hey, I don't have a, a global issue. You know, I want to just run a, a scalable Postgres yeah. compatible cluster yep. in my data center. Anywhere to too, right? On any cloud, it's not it's not tied to anyone. So if you go back to the slides, Tim, um, yes, you know, really being truly multi-cloud or basically being able, you know, not being tied to a particular kind of platform or a particular public cloud, right? This is, you know, so basically being able to run us anywhere is, is the whole thing. So. Just to wrap up, that was a lot. Thank you, Tim. That was awesome. So there was a lot of awesome comments. There too. were with the bad. There was good. <laughs> some good, some bad. It's Fine. a Reese's. It's well, chocolate. It's, it's, our first it's good. One. It's good and bad. Yeah, exactly. This is our first one here together. So, um, we'll you know, just to wrap up, you know, Cockroach DB and Kubernetes is kind of a natural fit. Um, I hope we showed that to you guys. I think the demo, you know, Tim going through, you know, killing off pods, having Kubernetes understand that the pod's gone, it spins it back up, it understands that up oh, Cockroach. And Cockroach actually taking care of all the replicas and making sure the data was there. It's just a natural fit. I mean, these things, they're just very well aligned. Um, you know, the Helm chart is available. Yep. Um, and then we link to that too. It's in Tim's yep. demo um, to ease deployment. A lot of stuff that we talked about persistent volumes, that's in the Helm chart itself. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go through that, it's there. Um, we talked at length about multi-region and geotagging um, to help with kind of the, you know, how would these things work? And so, um, I, you know, Kelsey is just a, a really wonderful speaker and a, a brilliant person. And so, hey, he says cockroach is the spanner as Kubernetes is the board. We, we like that quote. So we use it a fair amount because it's, um, it, it's right though. Um, and it just comes back to kind of the genesis of these projects. So with that, um, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. Charlotte, thank you for everything. Um, and, and there were a fair amount of questions that we didn't get to in the in the chat window or the QA. There was a couple in both different spots. Um, we will follow up with everybody afterwards uh, and get responses for those questions uh, for sure. Um, but in the meanwhile, if you do want to learn more, there is actually a deeper um, uh, webinar that we did with our friend Alex Robinson about running, um, you know, a multi-region Kubernetes cluster separate from Cockroach. I mm -hmm. think he uses Cockroach as a as an example, but just uh, using that as a webinar. 
Um, there's also a really wonderful post that was written by um, my friend Nate Stewart. Um, um, just what, what does it mean to be a Kubernetes native database, uh, which is also not cockro cockroach explicit. However, um, these are four primitives, the, the dash principle that he lays out that, that we have built our database on top of, which allows us to align very well with Kubernetes. So um, with that, um, again, I just wanted to thank everybody. We will send an email out uh, with a replay link. Charlotte is, I believe, sending out the survey or posting it in the chat. We would love the responses uh, back to just see how we can improve this. There's been some great comments and feedback in the, into the chat already. So awesome. Tim. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, as always, a pleasure, buddy. So all right, everybody, thanks for taking the hour with us and have a great day.